There are very few ways that one can become a billionaire overnight. You could A, win the lottery, B, marry well, very well, or C, get your hands on the 100 trillion Zimbabwean dollar banknote. Okay, granted, that note is not worth very much. In fact, before it was removed from circulation, it was barely worth more than the paper it was printed on. The comically high banknote was a result of hyperinflation and an economy that was knocking at death's door. But how did a country that was once known as the Jewel of Africa because of its rich agricultural industry become the shell of a country it is today? Well, the story begins where all failing African nation stories begin, with colonialism. At a time where Africa was being cut up into tiny consumable pieces, Numerous European nations had their eyes set on a small portion just north of South Africa. At the time, the Beers, who were descendants of Dutch colonizers and traders, were already making their migration through South Africa in an effort to escape the hold that the British Empire had over the South African Cape. There were two major tribes in present-day Zimbabwe at the time, the Shona and the Ndebele. The Ndebele led by King Mzilikazi, had fled South Africa after losing their land to the Beers. After the king's death, he was succeeded by King Lobengula, his son. Under him, the Ndebele kingdom was established and the Shona were mere subjects to this kingdom. It was King Lobengula who would go on to make a deal with the devil. He sold mining rights to a British magnate named Cecil John Rhodes. Well, dear old Cecil arrived with his army buddies, and they declared war against the king. When all was said and done, they took over the small nation and named it Rhodesia. You must be a special brand of narcissist to name a whole country after yourself. Once he had control over the country, Rhodes started moving white settlers into the nation. By 1930, the government, which was now officially a British colony, had laws in place that ensured that the white minority in the country were given more than half of the land in the country, with the African majority only getting 29.8%. By 1965, Rhodesia had declared its independence from the British Empire, however, it was still under white minority rule. This little history lesson might have your eyes glazing over, but before you click fast forward, this colonial history is vital to the why why the Zimbabwean economy eventually failed, and why its resuscitation is damn near impossible. Less than a decade after Rhodesia gained independence from the British Empire, a ferocious civil war was sweeping the nation with opposition parties ZANU and ZAPU leading the fight against white rule. Finally, on the 18th of April 1980, Zimbabwe gained its official independence under the rule of the man, the myth, the legend, Robert Mugabe. Robert Mugabe's reputation precedes him, He's firmly cemented his name in the Hall of Fame for African dictators. He will forever be known as a ruthless man who cast fear in the hearts of the people he once fought to protect. But he wasn't always that way. After Zimbabwe won its independence, Mugabe's government made worthwhile changes. He increased healthcare, the life expectancy rose, and he put more children in school. But as they say, absolute power corrupts absolutely. All too often, Africa has seen its liberators turn into dictators. Why? Well, the answer to that is nuanced, but sometimes I like to think of it like this. Imagine you find a starving person. That person has known nothing but struggle, but during dejected walks through the streets, they might peer into restaurant windows and watch as rich diners feasted on seemingly unlimited food. Now imagine you take that person and put them in front of an all-you-can-eat buffet and tell them that everything there was theirs for the taking. As you can imagine, that person might gorge themselves on food until they couldn't possibly eat anymore. And when their stomachs refuse to accept any more food, they might start stuffing their pockets. See, that person has experienced deep longing and unprecedented hunger. The offerings in front of them are a luxury that they have never tasted and one that they aren't sure they'll ever have again. Now think of these liberators turned dictators as that starving person. Perhaps that might help us understand why they do what they do. Regardless of the reasons behind why, Mugabe steered the country straight off the cliff and landed it squarely where economies go to die. Sanctioned city. One of the decisions that did not earn Zimbabwe any popularity contests was Zimbabwe's involvement in the civil war that broke out in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mugabe provided the DRC president with extensive military support. 
However, it seemed that Mugabe was writing checks that his country couldn't cash. The Zimbabwean economy buckled under the weight of another country's war. Despite regular Zimbabweans pleading for the government to withdraw from the DRC, Mugabe instead increased the country's military involvement in the war. This had people wondering why Zimbabwe was providing this support in the first place. Surely the fledgling republic had bigger fish to fry. At the time, Zimbabwe was experiencing the worst of the AIDS epidemic, and it was reported that about 25% of the population was HIV positive. As it turns out, Mugabe had a business interest in the continuation of the DRC war. The Mugabe family and the then president of the DRC had a couple of military contracts on the go. One worth 200 million, US dollars that is. By the time Zimbabwe withdrew from the war, it was dealing with massive losses. Much of the military resources were destroyed in the war and army was essentially crippled. Mugabe's regime was in trouble and the public was becoming disillusioned with the once respected liberator. Unfortunately for the people of Zimbabwe, things were only going to get much worse. Mugabe continued to lose favor amongst his people when he began the forced removal of white farmers. See, even though the indigenous Africans had won political independence in the 80s, white people, who made up less than 1% of the population, still owned 70% of the fertile land. So, how to fix that problem? Well, according to Mugabe, you just get rid of them using military force. Came, and so came those hefty sanctions. Let's say you're Mugabe. You're being hit with sanctions because of the countless human rights violations you and your military are committing. What's your next move? Do you apologize to the international community and work to rectify your wrongs? Or do you double down and start killing off political rivals? No guesses for which option Mugabe picked. As he grew more brazen with his disregard for human rights, the sanctions imposed on him worsened. By 2017, Zimbabwe's inflation rate was reported to be around 8,000%. Conditions in the country were as bad as they'd ever been. There were widespread power cuts and industries were failing. As the Zimbabwean population was stifled by poverty and grocery store shelves emptied from the lack of supply, government officials were tucked away in secure estates where they enjoyed all the trappings of life, complete with foreign cars and all the food they could ever ask for. It seemed like that starving kid at the buffet was not only stuffing his face, but he had locked the door and was licking his fingers as his emaciated friends looked in through the window. Despite how incredibly dangerous it was to be on Mugabe's bad side, an opposition existed. And finally, in 2017, the people's wildest dreams came true and at 93 years old, Mugabe resigned after four decades in power. Zimbabwe's current president, Emerson Mnangagwa, stepped into power and there was a faint flicker of hope among those who had witnessed the heartbreaking decline of a country that was once one of Africa's most prosperous nations. Ah, but alas, Zimbabwe has yet to see her happy ending. They say that the only thing certain is death and taxes. I would argue that corruption is an enduring phenomenon too. It's like energy. It cannot be destroyed, it simply passes from one form to another. Colonialism turned into authoritarian rule, which turned into what Zimbabwe is today. A recent documentary released by Al Jazeera exposed how deeply entrenched the corruption is in the current Zimbabwean government. The documentary exposed how government officials were smuggling gold, one of the country's most important resources, out of the country. This was all in an elaborate money laundering scheme that involved many higher ups, including the Zimbabwean Miners Federation president, Henrietta Rashwaya a woman who is also believed to be the current president's niece. Nothing like fresh nepotism in the morning, huh? As it stands, Zimbabwe is slowly recovering from a sordid history of colonization and corruption. After the tumultuous period of forced removals of white farmers, some stability visited Zimbabwe and the country's GDP was, for a time, the fastest growing in the world. The formal economy is still small, but the informal economy is the real provider of people's day-to-day -day economic needs. Informal arrangements also account for the currency used in Zimbabwe. After the catastrophic collapse of the Zim dollar, the currency became, and remains, functionally useless. So Zimbabweans decided to adopt other currencies. Today the main currency in circulation in Zimbabwe is the US dollar. South African rands and Botswana pula are also accepted at many informal stores, despite the government's recent efforts to reintroduce the Zim dollar as the only official currency. 
Unemployment remains high and much of the arable land that previously gave Zimbabwe the name the breadbasket of Africa remains fallow. The people who were given ownership of the farms were not able to access financing to run the farm and so many of the farms failed. There have been some success stories but far too few to build an entire economy on. Zimbabwe has enormous potential to be a powerful and productive economy in southern Africa. All it needs is the right kind of leadership, which can inspire confidence of foreign investors and ignite optimism in the hearts and minds of ordinary Zimbabweans. Until then, all we can say to the Zimbabwean people is, good luck. <laughs>